Thank you so much for listening to Natural Alternatives right here on Progressive Radio Network. And I'm Dr. Ellen Kamai right here with you today. We always have our shows right here on Progressive Radio Network. And we have literally hundreds of shows available for your listening and learning. And you can really find all of us at naturalnurse.com. That's a great place to connect. You can email us. You can visit our Facebook page at Facebook, The Natural Nurse. And I do want to invite you to join us for many of our up and coming classes. We have a class that is starting very soon and you can actually join in anytime because it's starting soon live and it's also archived. And that's called Natural Nurse Herbal Certification Class. This is one of the best places to either start your herbal education if that's something that you'd like to do just for yourself and your family or if you're a health professional, this class offers 18 CEUs. And those are in um, for nurses, nurse practitioners, for registered dietitians, clinical nutritionists, licensed massage therapists, licensed acupuncturists, and NDs. So you can come on board and take the class. If you don't have any of those uh, licenses, then you can take it for your own knowledge. You don't have to have those licenses, but if you have them, an added benefit is the fact that you get 18 CEUs, which is great for those of us who need them. I just went through um, renewing my, my Florida nursing license. I have one in Florida, I have one in New York, so always gathering up those CEUs. In addition, if any of you are thinking you'd like to be a registered herbalist, that's an RH. It is the most highly um, recognized certification in herbal medicine in the United States. And if you're interested in becoming an RH, all of our classes are available for that as well. So if you go to naturalnurse.com calendar, you'll see a list of the up and coming classes. Um, they, they also are, uh, besides the natural nurse herbal certification class, we also have coming up one that's called Careers in Natural Health, which is a very popular one for those people who would like to do a career in natural health. Maybe you're out of work, you're regrouping, and you know, where would you like to go? So I invite you to visit our page, naturalnurse.com, look around, and you can listen to all of our radio shows there as well. So today we have a wonderful guest, and his name is Dr. Kevin NFNG. He is both an MD and a PhD. And he completed his medical training many years ago and became a senior lecturer and associate professor of pharmacology. He then was conferred a PhD at the University of London for his research on the dynamics of renin angiotensin system, which he has a beautiful PowerPoint. In fact, he has an amazing array of PowerPoints on slideshow, um, SlideShare and also on his site. After a long international and illustrious career as a leading force in pharmacology and the inventor of ACE inhibitors, uh, Dr. Kevin turns his interest, amazingly enough, and why he's with us today, to food as medicine, because that's where the science led him. Obviously, he is a preeminent researcher with an MD and a PhD, and he came to the conclusion that food can be used as medicine. And so he believes in Hippocrates' original teaching, let food be thy medicine and let medicine be thy food. So to um, get in touch with him after this show, we'll have a link to his email at kevingg68 at gmail.com. And thank you so much for being our guest, Dr. Kevin. I'm so happy to see you today. So, Dr. Kevin, we're going to talk about a lot of topics today because we have a full hour to discuss everything. But the first place I'd like to go is what made you decide with all your preeminent training, and let's call it conventional medicine, which you are a preeminent expert at, what led you to this concept as food as medicine? I don't think you were taught that in your medical school education. 
Well, thank you very much for, for the introduction. Well, the history is about food as medicine came not as a, something new to me, but when I was in the medical school, my father, who was a self-taught herbalist, kept asking me to look at the Chinese material medica. He told me that there is a lot of a wisdom in the uh, book. And he told me the story how the book was written. It all started with uh, a story about a divine farmer by the name of Shen Long. That was about 5,000 years ago. He was, in fact, the first clinical pharmacologist because he tasted about 365 herbs to find out what they do for himself and for others. The story was that he has a transparent abdominal wall. And whatever he ate you know, can be seen and can be evaluated. So all his observations were recorded but they were compiled in, into the book 2,000 years later. That was somewhere around uh, five, uh, uh, 50 years before uh, AD. And that book became a foundation for all Chinese doctors who wanted to practice uh, uh, the Chinese uh, traditional medicine. It, what is fact, the name it, of that it, book? It, it is, becomes... that the, is that The Yellow Emperor, the book The Yellow Emperor? What yes, book are you yes. referring to? The Yellow Emperor. The Yellow like, Emperor is a different person. He was there about the same time. Okay. The Yellow Emperor wrote the book called Neijing. In yes. fact, it was a textbook on, on the conversation between him and his advisors as to what medicine is all about. That is also another mandatory textbook for any traditional Chinese medicine. So now, let's go back. Book, Wait, now go back to the one you were talking about before. What's the name of that book? And is it translated into English? Oh, in English, it is called the uh, um, Shen. Uh, it, it, it's written in, in uh, it, is, it, it is a direct translation. Shen, S-H-E-N-G. Next one is Nong, N-O-N, Ben. B E N Ben Chao C A O last word Jing J I N. So it is a classic material medica of the Chinese, and that is a Bible for every traditional uh, Chinese medicine practitioner. It Isn't is not amazing Shen, because that uh, is you could get the English translation from huh? I think from Amazon. I think I bought one few years ago. So isn't that amazing that these remedies were written down literally thousands of years ago, and yet they have stood the test of time because they have also been scientifically studied as well as traditionally used in literally thousands of patients with excellent effects and a very low adverse effect profile. You're perfectly right, you know. And... Uh... And uh, my father always asked me to look at it. But when I was a young doctor, I told him that there, there's no science in it. I cannot bother about it, you know. But uh, oh, eventually, that was about 20 years ago, I recall what he taught me. And I went back to study. And I was amazed, you know. So what actually happened was that the drug, the ACE inhibitor that I came out in 50 years ago, became a drug. Okay, and wait a, a minute, synthesized... stop there, stop there. I wanna also point that out because this is an amazing thing about you. And we're so proud and happy to present you right here on The Natural Nurse and Dr. Z because your research actually led to this class of drugs which is used to this day called ACE inhibitors. That is a big thing. Yes. In fact, when, it, when the drug came out, it took the company about 10 years to synthesize it. So when I came to America in 1981, uh, the drug came out. I felt, oh, wonderful, I'm going to test it. The story is that it brought the uh, blood pressure down for most patients. Uh, 
it uh, improves the symptoms of a congestive heart failure, and it also reduces the proteinuria. In other words, the protein that leak out from the kidney in people with diabetes. But having practiced medicine for about 20 years, one day I was sitting in front of a Miami Beach, looking at the water. I told myself, what I have done and what I have come up with a drug is only a symptomatic treatment. It is not a, not a curative treatment. That then is amazing. So I you realized... recognize as the person who created this drug that yes, you could change numbers on a lab report. You could sublimate symptoms like putting a Band-Aid on a scratch but yet it was not a cure. And this came to you sort of as a spiritual revelation. Yes, and there was a time I thought that when I look at the patients who are obese, they have a high cholesterol, high triglyceride, uh, uh, very high hyperglycemia, and so on and so forth. I say, look here, Mr. So-and-so, you are just coming to me. I, I'm sorry, I cannot cure you, but I, I'm just only treating all your symptoms. That's how I say that you come, you might have come to me a little bit too late. If you come to me 40 years earlier, you would not have developed all these diseases related, you know, to obesity, overeating, wrong lifestyle. That is the time I turn my attention to food. After all, we are what we eat. But what made right? you do that? Yes, but what was that the revelation looking out at the water in Miami or something came to you that the chemistry of food influences health and wellness or did you read it in scientific literature? Your voice is a little bit soft. Let, let me turn on the volume. Okay, what I said is what made you come to the realization that food is linked to health and wellness? Oh, yes. And at that time, I was reading uh, an article in the medical journal. And what they did was that they take the fat out under the skin and analyze it. And then they found that the uh, concentration of omega-6 is very high compared to the uh, uh, concentration of omega-3. That was in about 40 years ago. At that time, the, the the uh, scientific uh, research workers were trying to find out what does a fat do to the body. This is the noise from your side or my side. Yeah, the noise, unfortunately, my gardener has just arrived, so that is my fault. Oh, my gardener, my gardener came yesterday. Uh, <laughs> so he treated my gardener, so he, he couldn't come again. Yeah, unfortunately, mine is here right now, but don't go away soon. So go fatty acids. They found that people like Eskimos, they have a very low concentration of omega-6 in their body. And omega-6 is a pro-inflammatory fatty acid. And then uh, the omega-3 is a good fatty acid. Now from the, uh, from the studies of amino fatty acids, they found that the current status of fatty acids in the body of the patients have a significant <clears throat> impact on their health. For example, if the concentration of omega-6 to omega-3 is high, then they are prone to heart, heart disease, diabetes, overweight, and so on and so forth. Now, I came into this picture because at that time, my mentor in uh, London, he was interested in inflammations. And then the prostaglandins came into, uh, came into the focus. So one day, I was doing my studies in the lab. He asked me, that was about 10 o'clock in the morning. He said, Kevin, could you hook up this uh, system for me? I just want to do simple experiments. What he did was that, uh, Go ahead. Don't worry. Are you okay now? Yep, everything's fine. Okay. 
Now, what happened was that he put a, he he asked me to string up a small piece of guinea pig intestine on a in a bath, bathe with artificial salt solutions, and then he added the arachidonic acid. Now, arachidonic is a precursor you know, of a prostaglandins. So he added the arachidonic acid into the bath. There was a contractions, and then he added aspirin onto it, and then he followed by he followed that with arachidonic acid, and then the contraction of the guinea pig intestine was substantially reduced. You know, so that's he realized that the arachidonic acid is. Uh, pro-inflammatory fatty acid. So let, me, let me break in here one second, because this is excellent information that you're sharing. And we're speaking today with Dr. Kevin NG, and he is a brilliant and top-notch scientist, both an MD and a PhD, and he's sharing with us now about omega-6 and omega-3 acids. Now, one thing we can do that we don't do enough of doctor, is test people in terms of their omega-3 and omega-6, because we can do that. And you're saying that ratio is linked to inflammation. Correct. And so you found that, that could you manipulate the ratio of omega-3 and omega-6 and bring down inflammation? That's exactly right. Now, this is a very interesting story. You know? It took a long time for the clinicians and the uh, nutritionists to find that out. Now, if you compare the ratio of omega-6 to omega-3, at this time, the ratio in America among the uh, American people is about 20 is to 1. Whereas when you go back to a few thousand years ago, when people were living on uh, vegetarian food and so on, the ratio was two is to one. So the ratio now is 10 times higher than before. Now, wow, so wait, wait, I want, I want you to tell me why. Why do you think? So you're saying the ratio, if we measure it in humans, has changed over time. And it's a different ratio now than perhaps 40 years ago, 50 years ago. Why has it changed into such an out-of-balance proportion? Well, this has been going on for the last 50 years or so. The statistics show that the ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 has progressively been going upwards over the last 40 to 50 years. And uh, why? Why? this is due to... Too much okay. fries, too much oil. So diet, you decided. So here's where we're going about why you decided food is so important. Because that diet change that you're saying was not always in place. But as we move to the fast food diet with a, more meat and more fried food, that's where the change came. And also the way the animals even ate, if you look into it, because even a cow that eats grass, has a different omega-3 to omega-6 ratio than a cow that is fed, let's say, genetically modified corn. Correct. Correct. So what can we do about this? You know, I was, uh, I was keen to find out why the Americans have this problem. So if the omega-6 to omega-3 ratio is high, the body is in a state of a chronic inflammation, like obesity, you know, the calorie is high, they put on a lot of weight, uh, and then uh, once the weight goes up, all the other problems will follow, like hypertension, uh, heart disease, diabetes, the whole lot of stuff will come. Right. So all what you're talking about, though, we say Americans, but what we find as even in an Asian society whose traditional diet was linked, let's say, to rice and vegetables and fish, 
but then a fast food res restaurant opens there or they move to the United States, one generation in, they have the same problems. So it's no. not so much genetic as it is diet. Yeah, this brings on a very interesting uh, question. I was giving another lecture on the longevity. Now, the, the st studies show that the Asians have an average life expectancy of about 88 years. The Af American life expectancy is about nearly uh, 80, about 10 years shorter. Now, in spite of all the advances we have in medications and in surgery and so on, yet the American life expectancy is somewhere around uh, 40, 43 or 45. So, in spite of all the advances we have in America here, the life expectancy is not the top. The people who rank number one in the world so far, I, I came across is Hong Kong, the Hong Kong Chinese, they, because they eat a lot of fish, vegetables. Now, if so you that's interesting. The, I thought you were going to say something like people in the Himalayas way up in the mountains or, you know, something like that, because Hong Kong has a lot of stressors in terms of city living. Sorry, I could pick up the last few sentences. So that in Hong Kong, it's a city. It's a city, right? So there's yeah. a lot of stress in terms of close quarters and all that kind of thing. Yeah. But yet so, you're saying they have excellent life expectancy. Yeah. So it's very interesting if you compare the diet uh, among different people. Of course, the one we talk about often is a Mediterranean diet. Yes, and what is that like? Well, you see, in the, the people in the, in the Mediterranean area, they use a lot of olive oil. And olive oil has very high monounsaturated fatty acid. That is a good acid. Now, on top of the olive oil, there's a small amount of chemicals that work exactly like aspirin. Are you aware of that? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Now, the, I, I was surprised to find that olive oil there are some some trace compounds there, and one of the compound was aspirin. Oh, I was, it's a similar it's a similar compound like salicylic acid. Yep, yeah, a small uh, amount of it. You know. So, besides the oil, you have additional uh, benefit from taking olive oil. Now, whether whether this uh, uh, salicylic acid in the olive oil contribute to the uh, Overall benefits of olive oil or not has not been well studied. Uh-oh, another project for you. So, doctor, we're going to take a little break here, and we're speaking today with Dr. Kevin NF, NG, MD, PhD, brilliant researcher, formidable scientist who actually brought ACE um, drugs that known as ACE inhibitors to the world, which is really major. I bet a lot of you listening are taking some of those drugs. But... He then thought about the fact that that's not an answer to health, and he looked deeper. So we're very excited to have him, and we will be right back with more right here on The Natural Nurse and Dr. Z. Natural Medicine Chest will discuss the essential oil taken from the Australian tea tree. The tea tree, known as Melaleuca alternifolia, grows in only one region of the world, the northeast corner of Australia. It is a full-sized tree of the myrtle family whose oil has powerful abilities to clean and help heal wounds and skin ailments such as cuts, burns, and rashes. In 1770, the infamous Captain Cook was a lieutenant in the British Royal Navy when his ship landed in Australia. The botanist on board, Sir Joseph Banks, collected samples of a sticky aromatic leaf and brought them back to England for further investigation. In 1923, an Australian curator and chemist, Dr. Penfold, 
conducted a study on tea tree leaves and discovered that their essential oils are 13 times stronger as an antiseptic bactericide than carbolic acid, considered the standard in the early 1900s. The oil contains 50 to 60 percent terpenes, 6 to 8 percent cineol, which causes its camphor-like odor, and several kinds of alcohols. In 1933, the Australian Journal of Pharmacy, the American Journal of the National Medical Association, and the British Medical Journal reported that tea tree oil is a powerful disinfectant, non-poisonous, non-irritating, and has been used successfully in a very wide range of septic conditions. Australian tea tree oil is mentioned in the British Pharmaceutical Codex of 1949, the UK Medicine List, and the Dispensary of the United States. During World War II, tea tree oil was considered a standard issue item for all first aid kits for Army and Navy units in tropical regions. The demand for tea tree oil exceeded the supply. However, after World War II, Synthetic drugs gained in popularity, and the use of tea tree oil in medicine waned. In more recent times, a renewed interest in natural, non-toxic alternatives has triggered a resurgence in tea tree oil research. In 1985, Dr. Paul Belache, chief of the phytotherapy department at the Faculty of Medicine, University of Paris, worked on several double-blind studies involving tea tree oil and its application as a remedy for candidiasis, chronic cystitis, staph and strep infections, and nail bed fungus. He stated, and we quote, the essential oil of Melaleuca has entered the team of major essential oils and emerges as an antiseptic and antifungal weapon of the first order in phytoaromatherapy. Try a few drops of tea tree oil in a steam vaporizer and inhale for blocked sinuses or rub the oil on chest and back for a cough. The Australian Journal of Dentistry reported that using tea tree oil in dental hygiene and in surgery showed it to be an extremely effective antiseptic. Add a drop on your toothbrush or include it as a gargle and mouthwash. Tea tree oil can be applied directly to the skin. Although it's possible that some people may experience a mild allergic reaction, in-depth research has shown tea tree oil to be non-irritating and safe. So listeners, think about including tea tree oil, the first aid kit in a bottle, in your natural medicine chest. Welcome back to more right here on The Natural Nurse and Dr. Z. And you can always find us at naturalnurse.com, either naturalnurse.com on the web or Facebook, The Natural Nurse. And I want to bring back our guest. Hello, Dr. Kevin. Are you there? Yes, I am. Good. And you can hear me now. Yes? Excellent. Now, you were just discussing a very, very interesting topic about omega-6, omega-3, and you, you said something I always learn more when I talk to you. I feel you are a grand master, and we are so lucky to have you there. Now, tell us your website where people can easily find you. I know you have one called Medicine Be Thy Food, or what is the name of that website? Well, uh, the, uh, the website is still under development. It okay. is called Food as medicine consultants.com. Fine. Food as medicine consultants. 
com. That's excellent. And I know on SlideShare, if people put your name in, you have a vast array of excellent, excellent, so well-researched and laid-out PowerPoints. And I'm so impressed by them, and, and I was fortunate enough to get your permission to use some of those slides when I am lecturing on similar topics. But you just said something I never heard before, which every time I talk to you, I find out is the case. I never heard before anything about um, olive oil having a similar, perhaps, anti-inflammatory or a, a modulating molecule that is similar to the action of aspirin. I never heard that before. It's fascinating. Olive oil, in fact, when I was doing the studies on food as medicine, I wanted to know exactly what people eat and what are the components in the food or the oil or the uh, sweetener and so on. Now, the last time, just about a week ago, I put up a slide on watercress. Are you aware of this vegetable? Watercress. Yes. yes. Tell us about watercress. There's a lot of new research about it. Watercress, oh. it grows in the water. It looks kind of like, I don't know, sort of like parsley. It's a little green leaf. So please do tell us about watercress, Dr. Kevin. Oh, it's a fantastic food. In fact, this is what I call a super food. What, what I found was that... Uh, it has uh, so much ingredients that are anti-inflammatory, antioxidant, uh, immunomodulatory. In other words, it boosts up your immune system and is anti-cancer. Now, there's so much basic research done on it, uh, and I was just fascinated by it. It was I put it up in the slideshare.net, and in, in less than a week, I get more than more than a thousand views, you know, and I oh, get a lot of great. reviews so from, from people this, who say that. And you've got yeah. over a thousand views, so so definitely your research is getting out. That is fantastic. What the crest is phenomenal. So I call up a company, I think in Georgia, they use a hydroponics to grow uh, watercress. And then I found that watercress, it can only be grown in Florida and uh, Texas. And in Georgia, it is supposed to be a sort of invasive uh, uh, vegetation. And then uh, it is uh, uh, not, the government takes a, you know, uh, uh, takes a lot of uh, precaution to make sure that, that this watercress do not invade other, uh, other species. Now, following the watercress, I was asked by a few companies on other superfood. Then I found that there's another plant called Moringa. Have you heard of that? Oh, yes, because I live in Florida and I have Moringa trees all around me. And it is a phenomenal thing to use those leaves. Oh, I had one plant when I was in Florida. It grows so fast and so well. Then I had to move, you know, and I lost track of it. But... Colleagues of mine have been asking me how to promote that. I said, this is one of the best, the best vegetable. And they call it the miracle tree. Are you aware of that? Yes. I, I've done a lot of lectures and presentations about Moringa. It is fascinating, the components that it has and the healing qualities that it has, with a very low incidence of any kind of harm. So please do tell us more about watercress and Moringa. <laughs> okay, now I have already put up my slides, uh, presentation in a slide share and a link in. Uh, if you Google it under my name, Kevin, K F N G presentations, you get all my presentations in a slideshare.net. Now the watercress was the, I think it was the latest one I put up. After that, I gave another webinar on uh, bananas. Huh? Uh, that was about two weeks ago. So I was preparing for my colleagues in India who asked me for consultations on Moringa. And then I found that Moringa has a component very similar to stevia, sweet, the sweetener. Are you aware of the sweetener? Stevia? Yes, stevia, absolutely. We've used that in nutraceuticals for, oh, 30 or 40 years. And it's very interesting in one of the books I wrote, Arthritis, 
the alternative medicine guide. We discussed that when Stevia first came on the market. The FDA actually attempted to outlaw it because yes. the sugar industry did not want it to be discovered. Yes. So I have been asked to be a consultant for this company uh, overseas. I Because I planted a tree myself, you know, and I ate the leaves. They were fantastic. What I found recently was that there is a component called uh, moringin. It is. It works almost a, a little bit like piperin, like the extract from the uh, black pepper. Now, black pepper is my favorite uh, spice now because I know so much about it. You know, I put up in my slides. You know, on the so-called uh, anti-inflammatory properties. In fact, I just applied for the patent. You know, to use a uh, black pepper for uh, various uh, 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 inflammatory disease like. People with aches and pain from sports injury, it works wonders. So you don't have to use the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug you know, to stop the inflammation. Black pepper will do just the same thing. So what I found uh, recently is a lot of amazing bioactive chemicals like in the watercress, in the stevia, which is a sweetener, which is about 300 times sweeter than your ordinary cane sugar. Now, the other, uh, the other uh, uh, topics that fascinated me most was so-called the desensitization of the uh, receptor called TRPA1, the transient receptor potential voltage 1. Now, we know that if when you take the capsaicin hot chili, you get the sort of a heat in your tongue. So you're yeah. talking about like even with, let's say, cayenne pepper as There's well as cayenne, black pepper. But it also feeling works, the heat in your tongue. Now, this cayenne pepper works on one kind of a receptors, but recent research shows that it also works on another type of ion channel receptors. And that opens up a whole field for nutrition, uh, research, uh, taste, you know, and then I just put up a stevia uh, slide uh, presentation on stevia. And I was amazed that stevia was introduced into this country only around 2009. 2009. Now, because the stevia leaves behind uh, a, a little bit of a bitter taste in the tongue, so the industries added on another compound called xylitrol which is a sugar alcohol. It takes away that, you know. And other, pe other industries uh, add, uh, well, there's a, add xylitol, another not, sugar just called so mouth, quickly through mouth an amazing array of nutrients, no, they, all of no. which have been really deeply studied in terms of their positive effects. And you jumping into this conversation is so useful because you really understand mechanisms of action. Now, with xylitol, the one, the one caveat that I do want people to know, and I imagine you're aware of this, Dr. Kevin, is that it's very toxic to dogs. Yeah, and perfect, hundreds of dogs perfect. are you're dying right. or needing liver transplants that not everybody can afford a liver transplant for their dog because they'll get into someone's pocketbook and they have, like, gum, that sweetens with xylitol. Why do you think it's so toxic to dogs but does not seem to be toxic to humans? Well, it's all boiled down to the enzymes. All boiled down. Like, for example, I don't have the so-called uh, dehydrogen, dehydrogenase for alcohol. I couldn't even tolerate two tablespoons of a beer. Imagine that. Whereas my wife can drink, like, drink the beer or whiskey like a fish. She has <laughs> Don't the uh, enzyme in the liver <laughs> that break down virtually all the alcohol that she consumes. That's so, so you're saying that dogs, the structure of their enzymes makes xylitol a toxin to them. Well, yeah. it's not a toxin to humans and can be very yeah. useful as a sweetener and also has some very good data on its ability to help with periodontal disease. So nowadays, they are, they are combining stevia with xylitol just to take away the bitter sweet, you know, the, bitter, uh, the bitterness towards the end of it. 
Now, do you know that the tongue has got several areas? Some areas are for only for sweet, sweet. Some areas for salt. So some you're areas talking for about the areas on and some the area for the umami. This the is taste, the taste yes. discovered by the Japanese. Yes. So different areas of the tongue are stimulated by different things, which give us different taste sensations. I, I'm just fascinated by this field lately because I talk to some uh, chefs, uh, uh, some some uh, so-called executive chef. I say, I I say, how how do you taste? You know, how do you taste a food? You know, so they are not trained as my, as as myself. So they talk about pairing. Pairing uh, uh, food, so like for example, you have to pair uh, cucumber with this, and then it works good. I said scientifically, I want to know why it is better, and uh, that that led me to the search for a sweetness, a saltiness, bitterness. <laughs> then the Chinese believe that anything that is bitter is beneficial for health. That's very you- interesting. Right. In most other cultures, bitter food is included. But in the standard American diet, where we're getting these massive heart problems and everything, there's no bitter included in the standard <laughs> diet, only salty and sweet and fried. They're talking about this bitterness. This is a story. I had a patient, you know, a Hispanic lady who was overweight and uh, suffering from diabetes, arthritis, and so on. So she could not tolerate most of the medications. She said, Doc, uh, she came from Cuba. She told me that in Cuba, if a Chinese doctor cannot cure you, you are gone. <laughs> so he said, she asked me, you know something. Uh, you know something. You, you have to let me, let me try it out. I'm not interested to try the Western medicine. So I said, if you agree, this is what... I would suggest. So I introduce uh, the bitter gall. You know what bitter gall is? Bitter gall. Uh, I don't know what it is. What plant is that? It is a it's a vegetable. It's a fruit. It's a you could only get it in a Chinese grocery. It is very bitter, but you have to cook it with uh, with beef or something else to take away the bitterness. So. I introduced her. She went to Hialeah. She went to a Chinese a grocery uh, store and bought the stuff. So about six months later, she came back and said, Doc, it did wonderful things for me. She lost about 15 pounds in six months. The blood pressure was normalized. The cholesterol was way down. And the sugar... I said, this is phenomenal. I have to do a clinical trial on it. You know? You know? And uh, following that... Uh, she told me that the price of the bitter gall has gone up nearly five to ten times because Uh-oh, she did so well on it. <laughs> <laughs> but so I took a few doctor friends to a Chinese restaurant. I said, I have this story to tell you. Would you like to try this bitter gall? They said, Yes, we'll try anything you suggest. So they put the bitter gall into the mouth. Immediately they say, Oh, it's horrible taste. <laughs> so I told him. There's a Chinese uh, bacteria medica stated that anything that is bitter is good for health. <laughs> so I told them the story about this uh, Hispanic lady you know, who did so well on, on the bitter gall you know, that the price has gone up five times you know, in, the, in the grocery store. Because so nice story to tell something about food as too. medicine. So there are a couple of patients. I managed to put them on just vegetables, you know, a proper diet. They don't. They did not have to take any like metformin, uh, glyburide, and so on and so forth. You know? So I found that I was on the right track, and that's how I continue working on food as medicine. Wow, that's amazing! So it just goes on and on. The more that you discover, and then when you go into the molecular understanding of this. That just broadens your perception of why these foods are good. We're going to take another little break right here on The Natural Nurse and Dr. Z. And when we come back, we will continue our discussion with our brilliant guest today, Dr. Kevin NFNG. Um, you can find him as uh, at Food as Medicine Consultants.com and also on SlideShare. Just 
put in his name, Kevin Ken, KFNG, and you'll find a variety of beautiful, beautifully presented um, information for you. So we will be right back with more right here on The Natural Nurse and Dr. Z. And welcome back once again to more right here on The Natural Nurse and Dr. Z. We love to hear from you. Get in touch at naturalnurse.com. And while you're there, sign up for our free newsletter. All we ask for is just your email. You can put it in at the bottom of the front page. And go on calendar if you're interested in joining us in any of our up-and-coming trainings and classes, if you'd like to become a registered herbalist, if you'd like to get 18 CEUs for whatever professional training that you're involved in, but take the classes in natural medicine, or if you'd just like to learn for yourself and your family, all are welcome to extend their knowledge. I have been doing natural medicine since 1964, and my passion is to expand people's awareness. And I am so thrilled to have as my guest Dr. Kevin N. K. F. N. G. M. D. and Ph.D., preeminent inventor or discoverer of ACE inhibitors, who has then moved on to realizing the complexity of medicine in foods and herbs, really, which was passed down to him from his elders. So thank you so much for being our guest today, Dr. Kevin. You're welcome. Uh, It's really a treat to have you on, to have someone with such a high level of training. And also, um, you're no kid, I'll say that. I'm not either. But you're still so excited about as you find new things in research. Well, research... For me, it's a passion. See, my father always told me, learn, learn. There's always wisdom in learning. That's how I found it. The more I learn, the less I know. That's a common saying. And uh, as far as food is concerned, I think the uh, educational institution should start teaching medical doctors or whoever it is, you know, that Food is something that we eat every day. There are so much things in the food that can make us healthy. And uh, I was surprised to find that in the, uh, among the uh, nutritionists and dietitians, I asked them how much pharmacology of chemicals do they learn in their, in their curriculum or in their uh, four, three to four years. I was surprised that they only have a couple of lectures on that, you know. But if you learn all about the food and the pharmacology, why it works, how it works, and what are the benefits, and what are the uh, side effects, you know, know, it makes you a better doctor, a better nurse, a better nutritionist, and better dietitians. And my aim is is that if I could bring this forward by uh, presenting my lectures in the internet and a webinar and... uh, and in a podcast, I think I would have done another job, you know, a better job for the humanity. This is why a lot of uh, companies overseas are asking me to help them out how to improve the nutrition in their community. You know, it's yeah, fascinating. I, I'm, I'm, a, I, I'm very, one very group that uh, excited by this uh, new thing. I never knew that from being a doctor. Uh, there's so much thing you need to learn, especially food. You know, there's a saying I think in the uh, Ayurvedic medicine that if the diet is wrong, the drug is of no use, and if the diet is right, medicine of is of no need. It's a wise saying. Huh? Wow, who made up that saying? This is Ayurvedic. Ayurvedic, oh, in uh, Ayurveda. Yes, I studied so that Fantastic too. quote. Uh, this, I learned it from my friends overseas uh, through the uh, uh, email correspondence. Uh, they say, Doc, have you heard of this? I say, oh, I put it in, in, in a couple of my lectures there. So there's, there's somebody who's not happy about that, Dr. Kevin, and that might be the pharmaceutical industry. <laughs> yes, I know that because I used to be a consultant for them. One of them told me, Doc, 
don't develop anything or discover anything that will cure because we make no money from that. I said, what do you want me to do? You want me to be just only a symptomatic a reliever? And the answer is yes. And then unfortunately, many of those things lead to needing new drugs because you take one thing like an ACE inhibitor, but then it might have side effects that you need other drugs for. Yeah, this is a good story. When the ACE inhibitor first came out, that was 1982 or early 83, you know, it just came out. Uh, and then uh, uh, a lot of the 20% of the patients would develop a cough. And one of the patients came to me that he's coughing, she was, he's a he, coughing day and night, you know. So he went to see the uh, uh, ENT guy, went to see a uh, lung specialist and to see so many specialists. Then she was introduced to me. My first question to her was, what medications are you taking? She said, I'm taking Capitan three times a day. Ah, ha, ha, ha. I said, I know exactly what is wrong. Stop this thing for two weeks. Come and tell me. So she stopped the appeals. She came back to tell me, Doc, you are a miracle man. I stopped coughing. <laughs> At that time, because I knew the pharmacology of Capitan so well that Although it brings the blood pressure down, it retains some of the chemical called bradykinin. And bradykinin is a chemical that works on the lung and constricts the lung. It makes you cough like crazy. You know? So I wrote up a, a paper that the doctors who use the ACE inhibitors should be aware of this side effect. You know? It's very common. It's, it occurs in Chinese especially. Uh, cough induced by capitan. Uh, is about 20 to 25 percent, you know? not so much in the, in the Caucasians. That is fascinating information, and we are so fortunate um, to have had you as our guest right here on The Natural Nurse and Dr. Z. You gave me things to look up. I'm going to look up on SlideShare um, some of your newer postings. I, I actually found you because I was giving a lecture on mushrooms, and I know you have a lot on mushrooms. I know you have a lot on hemp and cannabis. Uh, we're getting to, close to the end, but I'm going to throw this question out if you can hear me. Can you hear me well now? Very well, thank you. Okay, so here's my question. In terms of cannabis, um, we know that the receptor sites for the cannabinoids, it's interesting because usually when, when things go across a synapse, it goes from one end of the nerve to the other in a forward motion, but we know with cannabinoids, it seems to send the information from the postsynaptic area to the presynaptic area of the nerve. I don't know that you can answer this right now, but you might look it up and let me know in the future because I have not been able to figure it out. They did figure out that's how it happens. When they're sending um, some of the endocannabinoids, particularly the CBD, across the synapse, instead of going from presynapse to postsynapse, it goes backwards. But I've never seen any explanation about if we know why it does that. You, you look it up in my slide presentation on cannabinoids. Okay, from, I'm going to... Uh, Going to do yeah. that. <laughs> I have I have a lecture on that on canopy noise. Well, also, you know, as we go off air today, at some point, you and I can have a personal conversation. I am so happy to know you and to have you as someone to learn from. Your knowledge is so advanced and so fresh and new, and also reaches back in time um, to the tradition additional knowledge from thousands of years ago, as well as be based in science and evidence-based medicine. You are truly someone very special to know, and thank you so much for being our guest today. You're most welcome. And listeners, I want to thank you for joining us once again right here on Progressive Radio Network. You can always get in touch with us by going to our website at naturalnurse.com or 
Facebook, The Natural Nurse. You can email us. Go around to the calendar and see all the classes that you can join myself and Dr. Eugene Sampron on. And we're giving some outside herb walks coming up, like in June and July. If any of you are in the New York area, those are already scheduled. And thank you so much for joining us today right here on The Natural Nurse and Dr. Z. Until then, stay healthy.